This is the Soul Filled Sisterhood Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Burgess, licensed marriage and family therapist and an empowerment coach for women. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now here is today's episode. Episode 133. Do you have a loud inner critic? You know, that voice inside your head that is nonstop and beats you up because you mess up or things aren't perfect or tells you not to assert yourself and ask for what you need. I know many highly sensitive professional women struggle with this, but if you head over to today's show notes, you can download your own guide in turning your inner critic into your inner guide in four steps. Now, here is today's episode. Well, welcome, sisters. I am so excited about this conversation. I have Catherine Polan Orzek. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist who has worked in the field of mind body wellness for almost two decades and has taught mindfulness since 2000. She is currently on faculty at Oregon Health Sciences University in the departments of psychiatry and OBGYN. She has been on faculty at some of the country's leading mindfulness institutes and continues to be a pioneer in the field of mindfulness and self-compassion research. In addition to teaching mindfulness-based interventions in clinical environments, educational facilities, and in the community, she works with individuals and couples in the OHSU Center for Women's Health Clinic and in her private therapy practice. I also want to say that Catherine is a new author, and she has a newly released book called 52 Simple Mindfulness Practices to Slow Down, Relieve Stress, and Nourish the Spirit, a moment for me. And ladies, I've got to tell you, this is one of the best mindfulness books I have read yet. So Catherine, I just want to say thank you so much for being on today. Oh, this is such a delight. I'm really happy to be here with you. Well, would you mind sharing with my listeners a little bit about what really got you into the path you're on regarding the mindfulness and self-compassion and what what made you want to write this book? <laughs> well, my mindfulness path um, is a bit circuitous. So I um, I grew up in a household where the notion of contemplative practices was just the water we swam in. And so my my father was a priest and my mother was a nun before they ever met. <laughs> and, um, and so the sense of the sacred and um, just a, a spiritual life was something that it was just like completely, that's just what you do. Mm. And so I, I, I really acknowledge and credit just my family just for that mindset, you know, mm. as a setup. And it caused, um, you know, a lot of spiritual exploration and dabbling like my mom and I would go off to workshops and my dad was a philosophy professor and my brother was into this and that and so we all just kind of like were seekers as for seekers and um investigators had a, like yes. a lot of strong inquiry so um concurrent to that I uh my early life was spent in the ballet studio Mm -hmm. I, by the time I was 10 years old, I was dancing six days a week, four to five hours a day. By the wow. time I was 15, I was an apprentice for the Boston Ballet Company, had an apartment of my own, and then continued to work for Boston Ballet and other ballet companies in the U.S. and in Europe. And and so I had this really weird, I guess, <laughs> upbringing it was just so non-traditional. It was what I knew. Mm -hmm. um, like I didn't go to high school. I did all of my, I did college courses for high school credit back there was no such thing as online learning then so right. but I it was a very intensive life and by the time I was in my early 20s I was I was dancing in Europe and I I got really sick and um I didn't know it at the time but I had developed mercury poisoning Ooh, who knows how yeah right yeah. and I also had mono I mean I think and what I and when so when I came back to the states I was like really sick yeah. <laughs> I I just wasn't functioning very well now my mom you know as I had mentioned being someone who was constantly interested in the spiritual life had studied in the late 1970s early 80s with John Kabat-Zinn mm -hmm. in Boston because <laughs> that's mm -hmm. where we lived in New England and so 
I became aware of the adaptation to contemplative practice in clinical settings, just kind of through like it was just in the air and he was starting to publish books and teach more. And so I, I had this just kind of external awareness of it. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until, so I actually had to end my dance career in my early to mid twenties. And then I, I attended college, but was still very, very ill. And I had a physician who, um, he could really looked at the reality that what was happening to me was that my autonomic nervous system was like so dysregulated, meaning like I was constant, like my body was constantly firing off as if it were in fight or flight just yeah. because of the chronic stress and the you know intensity on my body, plus the mercury poisoning we didn't know about yet. Mm-hmm. But he, he was the one who said, look, you need to go do a mindfulness based stress reduction program. Wow. Yeah, I know. So I, uh, I entered and now, and at that point, you know, I had, I had lived, you know, in a lot of different places at that point, I was uh, 23 or 24. Mm-hmm. And um, so I had been doing yoga since I was 15, you know, mm-hmm. and I, so I, I knew about yogic meditation and different breath practices that I had done. I was like, and I even remember saying to him, I was like, I already do all that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Why are you he, recommending this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. You need to go do this. So I didn't, though. I didn't do it right away. And um, I, you know, I, I listened to John Kabat-Zinn's The Tape. It was, this is mm-hmm. like the early 90s. So it was yep. tapes at that point. Yep. <laughs> and started doing the practices. And then I started, and I was reading, you know, his book, Full Catastrophe Living. Mm-hmm. And I started to do them quite intensely. Um, and I started to notice, and I also was doing other treatments and things, finally discovered the mercury. So I don't want to say it's all meditation, but mm-hmm. yeah. I will say that after a period of, of six months of really intensive, like daily commitment to mindfulness practice, as was taught in the stress reduction clinic um, at UMass, developed, mm-hmm. program developed by John Kevinson, yep. I started to notice significant changes in my health. Wow. And that got me really interested because I had tried, I mean, I was one of these people that was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Western medicine, but let me do the acupuncture and the reflexology mm-hmm. and all the diets and all of this. And the, like, and, the, and, the, and any, anything I could get my hands on to try to feel like I could function in the world. Yeah. And it wasn't really until I, I mean, really it's like sit your butt down or lay it and do nothing but cultivate a kind of affectionate interest in the present moment Mm. through presence that my body, my nervous system was like, oh, there's another option for how to live in the world. Yeah. And so I, so I, as I said, I came in as a patient and then um, a number of years after that. And so I actually started, you know, I was working as a social worker at the time Uh and, um, I started just incorporating what I had been learning through my 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 own personal practice, as well as um, the reading I had been doing mm-hmm. with the with the families that I was working with. We were, you know, teaching, and so I just and this is before you know mindfulness with families and kids was like a thing. But right. I just I intuitively knew that there was something about presence and an embodied hereness. <laughs> It's not mm-hmm. a word, but we'll make it a one that had a profound influence. And so then when I went to grad school um, to become a marriage and family therapist, I, my, my whole, at that point I had bit the bug. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is, this is really what I, I believe is such a, a not, not a panacea, but a foundation for any of the other healing work yes. that is needed. Yes. And so I, you know, I, and by that point in grad school, that's when I, I, mean, I was living in Massachusetts. So it was like super convenient. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I went through, I finally did the formal MBSR as a patient, you know, <laughs> and then I, and I was like, Oh, now I get it even more. And then I, and then I went on to do a practicum and an internship at UMass. Cause again, you know, just one of the benefits of living, you know, Massachusetts. <laughs> and, right. And so got trained, um, you know, by some at the time um, at the the Center for Mindfulness at UMass is they're they're just some of their most really senior teachers and just was so grateful for that. And, and it, it just became my life's work. I just, Mm -hmm. something clicked 
and I, this sounds a little, you know, hyperbolic, but like it just seemed to me to be such a, a necessary ingredient for living. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It sounds like from your experience, it was such a an awakening for you mm-hmm. that that was you coming home to yes. self. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, I mean, that I, I used to feel like something like, like I'm crawling back inside my body or being yeah. poured back inside my body when I even had the awareness that my attention or my energy was so split off in so many other directions, as we all are most of the time. Yep. And so it is a homing um, and there's something not only nourishing and I mean, it can be scary to come home to yourself, but it's, mm-hmm. it's profoundly um, enlivening. Yes. Um, and you don't even have to strive for peacefulness. Like there's right. a, there's presence itself has an equanimity to it anyway. So that was, yeah, that was my personal journey mm-hmm. um, that, and and it's just continued. And I think one of the things that really, I mean, yes, going through the stress reduction program, but then when I started to sit silent meditation retreat was when I found a way of internally investigating my own experience and kind of the human experience mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that also really has shaped, I mean, it's shaped me as a person, but has definitely shaped me as, um, you know, somebody in the world of psychology and then also as a mindfulness teacher, that there's something about being in that space and having the guidance or the prompts from the teachers and, the, and, and just doing nothing but sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, yeah. walk, you know, with presence um, was really, I have, I, yeah, such, um, such richness comes from that depth of practice for me. And it has really informed my teaching, my writing, my clinical work, everything, my parenting, you know, everything. So for you, part of what drove you really then to write the book was what? So I had, I had written a book for New Harbinger already. I had wrote a book um, with a sleep psychologist called Mindfulness for Insomnia Mm -hmm. that was um, in some ways felt very easy. Okay. Like it was, it was, it was like, you know, I've been teaching now for 20 years, 25 years. Like, it's just what I teach. And even though it's, it's marketed towards and aimed at, we have a whole protocol specifically for working with the anxiety related to insomnia, mm-hmm. the basic unfolding of how do you access mindfulness practice, like step by step, by step mm-hmm. by step was like eh, second nature. I've been doing this for a while. I felt, I felt very, it was easy, confident. And then actually it was the publisher who reached out to me and said, Hey, I know that you have a lot of added, you know, things around attitudes and perspectives that I think, you know, we'd like to turn into a book. And I, and so I sat with it at first um, to think, well, how would I, and what would this be like? And I, I, what came to mind was a, um, a friendship that I have actually with one of my dearest friends. Mm -hmm. She and I have a commitment to, with each other to use our friendship as a platform for investigation and inquiry. Oh, beautiful. And the way our conversations, you know, because of this intention flow, what we consistently arrive at are what to me is the, is what all mindfulness practice is in service of, which is Mm self-awareness. Mm-hmm leading from that self-awareness into the cultivation of wisdom, Mm -hmm. which then once you have a a wise understanding of of what is happening in the present moment, the next thing that happens is compassion. Like it's just, there's a very consistent trajectory. And so our conversations really seemed to also consistently point to that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I was like, what would it be like if um, there was a book that kind of gave people that experience of, of bringing up different things because mindfulness and and any sort of contemplative practice is not just to make people better meditators. Correct. It's like, what's the point? You know, great. So you can sit on a cushion for a couple hours. Like if it doesn't, (laughs) if it doesn't permeate one's life, one's heart, like it, to me, it's not, there's, you know, there's nothing illuminating really about that. Yeah. And so this is that bridge, I, I think, um, mm-hmm. to different 
things that we experience in the general human experience mm -hmm. um, in a conversational, invitational form. Like, hey, let's look at this. Let's explore yes. this together through this particular lens in service of self-awareness, wisdom, and compassion. Um, so that's, that's kind of what gave birth to the book. Well, I love it. And I apologize, I was not aware of the first book that you were part of. Oh. And so otherwise, I would have announced that <laughs> to be oh, no, too. But no but problem. <laughs> I, I love though, as you were sharing your own like journey of like, as you went into this whole mindfulness practice yourself, it's like, having some of those steps or that structure. And I know for my my clinical and my coaching clients, they, they often reflect, thank you for the structure. Mm -hmm. Because again, we've got yeah. some of these tools and tips. It's like, oh, this is what has helped me or this yeah. is part of my training. And it's like, they get grounded in this mm -hmm. so they mm -hmm. can go deeper. That's and I right. think, yeah, like what you're talking about in your book, it is so much about an invitation to reflect, to gain insight, to be with you. And it there's prompts and everything that you have in there that are it's just mm. it really is inviting. Um, mm. That I really I think is a very nice way that you've incorporated it. And the other thing I want to point out to the, all my ladies who are listening, you wrote this. I want to say not only by months, but my sense is more like here's your seasons. Mm -hmm. How yeah. Yeah, yeah? How did you end up really kind of? Again, this is different than what most mindfulness books I've ever seen. How did you end up deciding on really creating the seasons? I think it's beautiful because mm -hmm. I talk about often in, like on the podcast mm -hmm. about women in different seasons. And mm -hmm. we sometimes are like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm only in summer and this is all I do. And I push, push, push. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the, I guess it's more of like an explicit acknowledgement that we're all influenced by. Yes seasonal transformation. Yes. And we are not separate from the context and the conditions in which we're in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's, mm -hmm. And so, and the other thing that is really when, uh, so what's coming to mind is, you know, my, my son um, uh, up until sixth grade went to a Waldorf school. I actually went to Waldorf school as a, but, and, and there's a lot of honoring of seasons and festivals and rituals yes. uh, that create a um, like a touch point, mm -hmm. like, oh, I know where I am in relationship to the larger world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if, I mean, I mean, gosh, you know, I, 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 I'm super into the, you know, female empowerment, you know, mm -hmm. reconnect with embodiment and mm -hmm. rewilding nature thing. Too. Yes. <laughs> so, so the, that like just being a part of nature and um, honoring our naturalness. Mm -hmm. And so then therefore, what are the seasonal transformations of mind and heart that correspond to the outer world? It's the inner, you know, inner unfolding of the seasonal evolution and the outer so that was that was you know what we had talked about in in, in conceiving of the format of the book, mm -hmm. and once I kind of clicked into that, um, <laughs> it's funny how because I I chose to accept this project and um, it was probably a little arrogant of me because I had just taken on a larger faculty position at the, at the hospital where I work and I had just finished my first book and I was like oh that was so easy this will be fun <laughs> <laughs> and then I you know all of my friends and my husband were like what, <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> and so <laughs> I feel like a lot of what came through came through by grace because I really didn't have the time to write this book, but I did. <laughs> and so I, I just remember, okay, I gotta, I've got to come up just with like a framework, like a table of contents, like where are we going here? Mm -hmm. And when I sat down with that intention, like, okay, I'm going to really, it just, it just flowed. It was like, beautiful. it changed some in the writing, but yeah, but not much, actually not very much. Wow. And so I, yeah, I just, as I said, that feels like an, a moment of grace. But um, when, when I really got in alignment with what it was that my intention was for having it have a kind of seasonal ritual evolution, then, mm -hmm. then it just came out that way. 
Beautiful. And what you're talking about, you call it grace. And I know on this show, I've had various folks that'll say, oh, you know, it's basically I'm channeling someone else or it's the universe or spirit or God. And I'm like, yep, mm -hmm, all of that. (laughs) All of it, whatever, whatever you want to call it doesn't really matter to me. Because nobody knows. Yeah, <laughs> but it is. It's like all of a sudden, like you're saying, it just really flowed out through you. And I, and what I mm-hmm. also enjoyed is you may refer back to movies or different things. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I know that mm-hmm. one. Oh, I resonate with mm-hmm. that. And it's just mm-hmm. lovely how it's those touch points, again, mm-hmm. to be able to go more inward. And I stress mm-hmm. this so often in the show of that self-care piece, but it is going mm-hmm. inward. Like, so many of my listeners, I know they're highly sensitive, they're introverts, they yeah. already have this beautiful, rich inner world. Right. But when we live in such a hectic, often hustle bustle oh. way, yeah. right? Yeah. Women, yeah. especially, there's cultural yeah. messages too, of like, you've mm-hmm. got to do it all, you've got to be it all. And then they really, truly become disconnected from self. And I say, That's then it. you get disconnected from soul which right. often drives our anxiety and depression and other mm-hmm. mental health illnesses mm-hmm. because we're not tapped into that deeper knowing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. And so all of these small little, you know, things you can do through the, the guidance of your book, I just love it. And really what you've, you've hit on too is the power of ritual. Yes. That is key. And I think so mm-hmm. many women, you know, when I've when I've gone to different spiritual retreats or silent mm-hmm. retreats, like you're saying too, mm-hmm. there's this ritual all the time, like we yep. miss in our daily life mm-hmm. if we're not intentional mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or it's even the awareness that we already operate under ritual, yeah. that from the moment we open our eyes, most of us, I, I don't know anyone that doesn't, it doesn't mean it doesn't change. Like, do you pee first? Do you brush yep. your teeth? Do you have a glass of water? Like we, from the moment we wake up until the moment that there are these touch points throughout the day that we just do. Mm-hmm. And so the only thing that separates those, those rituals from a sense of sacredness is a lack of awareness or consciousness mm-hmm. or intention. Yes. But yes. everything is an opportunity to connect with the the sacred unfolding of of a moment a day a life you know and that's so that was also part of the thinking of because it can feel oh what now I have to put self care on my to do list right yeah and that yes. is yet yet another obstacle and especially it's interesting you know this year with the pandemic mm-hmm. and quarantine and it's not always possible to get out and, you know, right. go get a massage or go get your hair done or go, mm-hmm. go go out with your girlfriends or whatever you want to do. All those things that maybe we have defaulted to us. But this is my only, you know, toolkit for mm-hmm. self-care that I think self-care needs to become self-relating. Yeah, that beautiful. The way in which we are in... Um, a new nourishing, uh, you know, um, almost parenting or deep friendship with ourselves. Mm -hmm. That is a profound act or experience of caring that you might not even get if you go get the massage. If you go get the massage and your mind is wandering all over the place with all the things you have to do, you're going to miss it. You know? (laughs) Which, I mean, I'm raising my hand because I've done that. Yeah. But instead, if the ritual is focused on the cultivation of of accessing the wisdom and loving mind or heart or whatever it is, you call Mm -hmm. it soul, whatever we want to call it, that we're all pre-downloaded with. It's not, I don't, it's not, no one doesn't have it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, Great grammar, but like, I didn't know how else to say it. (laughs) Yeah, I I know what you're you're saying. Yeah. (laughs) But it is, I guess for me, as you're even saying that, right, it's, I've had some training through the HeartMath Institute. And so for years, even prior to that, for me, I've always gone back to the heart. Yeah, and, right. you know, they've talked about the research. There's, you know, so right. much communication from your heart to your brain versus, yes, yes we've got a lot of brain crap to our heart. But right. it's like, right. let's flip the channel. Yeah. And yeah. it's fascinating because what you're talking about, whether you say soul is there, heart is there, whatever, it's like putting your hand over your heart. There mm-hmm. is a tenderness. Mm-hmm. There is love. Yeah. There's that, yeah. like you're saying, that friendship yeah. starts right there. And we all have it. Yeah. I love, so there's an, a meditation teacher in Australia who wrote a book called Meditation, um, Meditation Calming the Mind, or 
his name is Bob Sharples, but in his book, he has a quote about transforming meditation into an act of love Mm. instead of, and this is the line that I love He says, you know, instead of the uh, yet another form of the subtle aggression of self-improvement. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so this deep, warm friendship with oneself, that that's the purpose, that that's really the opportunity that we can access during yes. aware, mindful awareness. Oh. Instead of, I need to meditate to be calmer. I need to meditate to be more peaceful. I need to meditate to fix myself in some way. What if there was nothing to fix, but it was an opportunity to be in deep, warm friendship? Yeah. And that, I believe, is what is transformative about it. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I was going to say that is the transformation right there. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. For those that you work with, then, do you mm-hmm. often hear, which I know I've I've heard in my practice, but I'm curious, they know what you do. They know, again, marriage and family therapists, we see it through the lens of systems and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. also have, you know, this mindfulness teaching mm-hmm. on top of that. Do they, oh, I don't mm-hmm. have time for that, Catherine. I can't. Mm-hmm. You know, that's mm-hmm. for everybody else. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. Mm-hmm. Do mm-hmm. they often say that? And then as you incorporate that into your work or you show them small little things, like does that, do you see the shifting of or do they mm-hmm. typically seek you out to begin to even do that type of work? Well, it's changed over the years. I will say that as, you know, the popularity of mindfulness as a concept or even, you know, as heaven forbid we call intervention (laughs) um, um, has become part of the the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's out there in society now. There's, There's more people that are actually saying, oh, I want this clinician because of that. Beautiful. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't like most of us say, well, I don't have time. Right, right. Right. And so a lot of what we're looking at are, um, initially I focus on the ways in which we can be embodied in the present moment, just in our daily lives Mm -hmm. before I give sometimes instructions towards like, okay, you need to meditate every day. Right. (laughs) Because if if, if it's to to be able to, because it's, yes, formal meditation practice is so valuable. I mean, I'm Mm -hmm. never going to say it's not. And it's not helpful to set up more forms of resistance. Correct. So unless somebody is coming specifically for meditation practice or training, like, like in a class, or they're coming say, please help me learn. I don't, I don't have that. I don't hold that as mm-hmm. like, oh, you need to do this in order to work with me. Yeah. Although once people start to even just, you know, whether it's through a session or, you know, that invitation to pause throughout the day or to eat mindfully, to brush their teeth mindfully, to, mm-hmm. to pet their dog mindfully, um, they'll, it will often evolve into longer periods of, yeah. of the cultivation of awareness, mindful awareness. But And and then I'll, I give, um, you know, resources Mm -hmm. for folks because there's so much available out there There for, you know, apps and YouTube is full of stuff. And so in some ways it's gotten so much easier, but, but riskier too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fascinating. You do something similar to what I do. If they're, you know, feeling often very anxious or uh, overwhelmed, it's, Instead of adding like quote to their to do's, it's like, well, you know, are you being very intentional when you breathe? Are you noticing? Do you breathe just in your chest or do you breathe from your belly? And all of a sudden Mm -hmm. they start to pay attention like, oh, it's just Mm -hmm. breathing. I'm like, oh, so you actually increase your anxiety and stress. Let's see if we can Mm -hmm. decrease that by doing Mm -hmm. some belly breathing. (laughs) Right. Just shifting the awareness. And sometimes because I find that in order to access awareness, we need to feel safe in the present moment. Yes. And a lot of people don't know how to arrive in their own body and into the moment safely. Mm-hmm. Not that they don't know, but they haven't cultivated that as a as a, a dis, you know a practice, a discipline, a habit. Right. Um, so sometimes it's 
especially when, with anxiety or any sense of overwhelm or even emotion, beginnings of emotional flooding. It's that like mm-hmm. trauma informed. Okay. Let's feel your feet on the ground. Yes. Like just take a moment to feel your feet, take a moment to feel your hands in your lap, the, all the places that are being supported by something solid. And so therefore it's not an idea that you're being supported. It's a direct physiological experience. Let's just hang out with that for a moment. Yeah. And that sometimes it's as simple as that. <laughs> well, and you know, what's funny is I have a, a question here on my little sheet for you. And I was just yeah. like, what are some simple steps for women to begin to just even cultivate this mindfulness? Mm-hmm. And this is mm-hmm. it first, because mm-hmm. I, I see similar to like what you're even talking about. So many women, it's like I, their head comes into the room or, you know, yes. our, our session. And I'm like, let's see if we can get your body to enter as well. Yes. Yes. And when it's like, but I've got all these things to do. And I'm like, yes. And those two yep. things are actually connected, but we really truly need to connect them. Yes, and that, right. You're talking about that, that simple yeah. embodiment is feel your feet on the floor, your hands on mm-hmm. your laps, or if they're, mm-hmm. they're wringing their hands, do you notice mm-hmm. that you're, you know, mm-hmm. clasping your hands together or you're wringing them together? And, mm-hmm. and it's all just saying, you know, it's safe to be able just to bring your awareness yep. right back down into yep. all of your body. Yep. Yeah. And sometimes the, that just that, what I'm inviting people to observe is that awareness with a particular intention of Mm -hmm. accessing support Mm -hmm. does the work for us Yeah, that I don't have to try to feel safe. It's basically a a reorientation to the reality of the present moment of, of I am safe. Mm -hmm. If I look around the room, I mean, and this is a, you know, this is, you know, a trauma, you know, practice, like I look around Mm -hmm. and use my, my vision to encounter the present moment, like what's here. Mm-hmm. Ah, and like even that internal naming, noting three things, like, and I look at cross my midline, I turn my head from one side to the next, mm-hmm. like, oh, here, here, here. And it's something that, you know, I add into it kind of to not make light, but to ease them up. Like there's no saber tooth tigers here. Yeah. I say that a lot in my sessions, the saber tooth tiger concept. Saber tooth yeah. tiger here. Yeah. And so it's not to shame myself, like, well, no. I should be feeling safe. Nope. But it's really utilizing the body's wisdom yeah. by deprioritizing the narratives, the stories or the, mm-hmm. you know, that I'm telling myself in my mind into yeah. what is the physical reality of the present moment. Oh, there is safe. And so from there, and then yes, in, in inviting awareness into the breath. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes I'll add in um, an emphasis of of how the breath massages or soothes. It's like a rocking from the inside Ooh, or, beautiful or image. sometimes, yeah, that, because I mean, if we really feel it, 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 people often describe that wave like motion of the breath rather mm-hmm. than, you know, emphasizing a sense of concentration or focus, but just being touched by the breath. Mm-hmm. And so what I'll have people do is then maybe have enact some gesture of of care and touch from the outside too. So maybe it's the hand on the chest or maybe it's holding your own hand Mm -hmm. or maybe it's giving yourself a squeeze. Yeah. That, that when we just allow the breath, we're not trying to change it necessarily. I mean, there is practices specifically about changing or elongating inhalation or exhalation, but simply letting the breath do its thing, even if it's shallow, that, sometimes by just Mm -hmm. bringing it into our felt awareness, it starts to settle on its own sometime. And we can connect with the completion of a flow from inhale to exhale. Mm -hmm. Many people experience that as a kind of gentle undulation or rocking. And nervous systems really like that, (laughs) that, 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 um, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it, it, it harkens back and it's why rocking chairs are lovely or what we do with babies that, you know, and so we don't have to do anything except include that with a particular emphasis of being, being nourished with every inhale, experiencing letting go with every exhale. And so, you know, prior to bringing the attention to the breath, I'll you know, invite someone to maybe make some sort of soothing gesture to their own body, whether that's the hand on the heart or holding their own hand or wrapping their arms around themselves as, and I'll, I even say it, I mean, because sometimes I feel like people need the kind of the mm-hmm. science behind this. Like yes, when we do this, we're activating our reptilian, I mean, excuse me, our mammalian caregiving system. 
and you don't have to do much. Like, you know, you're, you are a creature of the world and this, it, it will do it on mm-hmm. its own, you know, just the warmth of your own touch. And so that being touched externally by our own presence, internally touched by the breath. And if particularly the anxiety has, you know, coalesced into some tightness somewhere, then that the breath that inside says, I see you, you know, I see you. We don't have, there's, and, and that is the embodiment of safety. Yeah. Because if I can mm. see it, be breathed, you know, provide comfort. Yeah. It means that my, the level of threat is not imminent. And therefore I can relate to what's happening with more compassion, more equanimity, more interest, Mm -hmm. more Mm -hmm. insight, but you don't really have to do much. (laughs) So, yeah. Well, and that's, it's really beautiful because it's, again, it's like, let's take the the non needed stress of like, this is just another thing to do to your list. It's right, more like, no, right. this is really the returning home to you yeah, and re exactly. reconnecting to the loving you that you are. Um, mm-hmm, oh, mm-hmm, yeah, just such mm-hmm, a beautiful process. Mm-hmm. And it's not like you have to like really, <laughs> what is the, my hand is like in this fist, like you've got to push through to make right, it happen. Right. It's like, no, it can really start with some small yeah. little things yeah. that begin to ha- with the shift and the breathing and coming back. And it's like, oh, yeah. and then again, the book just yeah. helps even deepen the process even more of allowing you right. to really kind of give you some structure to really reconnect with self as well. Right. Mm. Right. And I'm a big believer in the power of language, mm-hmm, too. Mm-hmm. And that um, the way those invitations t- to awareness are offered matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so because we can very subtly emphasize a kind of striving, okay, you know, bring the attention to you got to stay with the breath or, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. or calm or relax yourself that that injunction often is met physiologically with resistance. Mm -hmm. So really emphasizing um, the all we're doing is remembering. Yeah. Presence. Yeah. And in so doing, we are remembering ourselves, that organizational principle of, mm-hmm. of the experience of oneself, body, mind, spirit here now, Yeah, like maybe uncomfortable, but not really a problem. Mm-hmm. It's that way in which we're becoming, not becoming, let me, let me say that we're realizing wholeness yes. without the extra step of, of doing. Yes. Beautifully stated. And before I pivot, because I know I'm just kind of being mindful of our time as well. I am curious, before I share your website and all that good stuff, what are some of your own self-care practices that Mm -hmm. you do? Mm -hmm. Again, you've Mm -hmm. you've been, you know, a mindfulness teacher, and I know you incorporate some of these things. What are some of your things that you do, whether it's on a daily or weekly basis, that help you take that moment for you, take those moments for you? I I have found that the utilization, I mean, we all talk to ourselves all the time. Like that's just like, I mean, and and I don't mean in a clinical, like I'm hearing voices and I don't recognize them as myself. I I just would like that, that narrator is is yammering on and, (laughs) but it's trainable. Mm -hmm. It's trainable. And so one of the practices, and I don't mean mantras or something, but intentionally practicing how I talk to myself. Yes. So for instance, like I notice that, um, you know, sometimes even in between sessions or if I'm running out, like, and I mentioned to you, like with my father's own, like, okay, I got to run down and rush to help, you know, my dad or things that are going on. I have developed this habit of asking myself, <laughs> Hey, sweetheart, <laughs> don't forget your spine doesn't, you know, doesn't really need to be that rigid to do this. Like with this moment. I'm like, Oh, thanks Catherine. Mm-hmm. Like, and so sometimes, sometimes it's just a remembering to bring awareness into how I'm holding my body, yeah. but I've cultivated that through like 
that habit of what I talk to myself mm-hmm. instead of like, oh my gosh, I've got to get to this, 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 including the habit of let's check in. Yeah. How are you doing, babe? What's going on right now? Yep. And it's fascinating though, right? I mean, it it doesn't take much for us to be no. able to pivot our thoughts, but even just how you say, hey, mm-hmm. sweetheart, spine doesn't have to be held that way. And it's funny as we're having a conversation, I'm noticing, you know, I was slouched over onto the <laughs> left and I was like, Okay, yeah, sweet yeah. Pete, let's just straighten up a little bit so your back doesn't yeah, hurt. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly. But it is those little loving moments when you just so check true. in versus what is wrong with you? Why can't you? It's like, no, 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 yeah. no, no. Because that just increases the tension and the frustration oh, and the yeah. stress. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh. That that internal dialogue is one that I feel like I've consistently cultivated. In fact, I tell, I tell a really it's kind of an embarrassing story. And do you live in the Pacific Northwest where we have um, a, a relationship to certain certain herbs mm-hmm. d- that are different in, in different parts of the country? And I am not a, I'm not someone who utilizes those things very regularly. But on one occasion, I did mm-hmm. and didn't really know what I was doing. And so um, proceeded to get violently ill. Um, I ate an edible, a cannabis edible. And um, my husband and I were with our son were driving from Berkeley, California into Podunk, Nevada, where my husband had to do some work. So anyway, I got really, really sick. But the thing that was significant was that that entire year I had made um, the mindfulness practice of loving kindness or metta, Mm -hmm. my primary daily practice. It uses often in some forms, the recitation of certain phrases Mm -hmm. to access loving kindness, the loving friendliness towards oneself Mm -hmm. or others. So those phrases were, so in my very compromised state. Mm-hmm. That's what came to mind. Mm-hmm. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you live with ease and peace. Like, and it was like my my mind immediately went into just repeating mm-hmm. these loving, supportive aspirations mm-hmm. for my own self. Mm-hmm. And then I did for my husband because he was driving and I was crying and throwing up on my, as as my son likes to say, mommy threw up in her underwear. (laughs) Yep, I did. Um, So, yeah, so, but it was a really, but it came from practice. It came from an intentional commitment to expose my mind, to incline my mind in that direction again and again and again and again. Mm. And that there, it, that's not necessarily, um, it didn't, it doesn't take more time out of my day, mm-hmm. but it does take a devotion and a commitment mm-hmm. to infuse my internal narrative with some supportive messages. Yeah. <laughs> not to say I do that all the time, but, but it, I do notice that that self-compassion practice has been a real boon in my, in my, my mindfulness yeah. practice. Like it's really changed the way I have, um, uh, experienced my meditation, my formal meditation practice, as well as informal. Yeah. Well, it's also it, you know, I talk on a show sometimes where it's that's, it raises the vibration level too, right? Yes. We're coming from yeah. a place of love and mm-hmm. compassion and gratitude mm-hmm. versus the lower um, vibrational levels. And I don't classify mm-hmm. I've said it so many times on this show. I'm like, I don't think emotions are good or bad. Right. They're just different vibration levels, right. whether you're like kind of squeezing yourself shut in the yes. sense of like, oh, this sucks and I'm awful yes. and I'm really angry right. or raising myself up. And so that yes. training, like you're talking about, really is rewiring your brain. It, absolutely. And it absolutely. truly does shift the perspective and you are much easier. It makes it easier yep. to tap into that That's right. because of that cultivation, because of that intention, right. because of that devotion. Yeah. So- what a beautiful thing, even though you were so sick. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I and, share that story. Yeah. I mean, because it's, you know, it was so yep. clear. But of course, that I, there's other ways that that shows up. That's just a, right. <laughs> right. But, I, you know, going to your point about vibration um, and not judging good, bad, right, wrong, mm-hmm. that every moment can't be other than it is because yes. the conditions are there for it to be that way. Mm hmm. Now, conditions, they include things that are, of course, beyond our control. But there are certain conditions, including mind states, Mm -hmm. that when added to the phenomena of the present moment, can't not have an impact. Right. Right. It's like if what gets planted in the garden is carrots, 
Mm-hmm. And I, that's what I plant. And I continue to water carrots and cultivate carrots and nourish carrots. I can't get ticked off because peas didn't grow. Right. So if, so the thoughtfulness of what and what am I adding to the conditions of the present moment? And it's just, I mean, it's basic, just like natural laws. It's mm-hmm. not woo woo. It's not, even. it's just, this is just the way it is. Right. So yeah, the, the, in, the willingness to intentionally nurture a, a particular state of mind, of heart, through awareness, through invitation, through the, you know, internal narrative, all of these things, the way I talk to myself has an impact on the conditions. Mm, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I, and I think that's to, to say, I mean, I think that was also what I was hoping in this you know, in this book to mm-hmm. explore or what are the conditions that give rise to some of the human capacities, like loving awareness, yes. like connectedness, the recognition of interconnectedness. I mean, all of those things mm-hmm. that we aspire to, like, well, what really is required to access those things? Mm-hmm. Well, ladies, if you want to find out more about Catherine or her book, again, I'll have everything on the show notes. Her website is CorvallisMindfulnessTherapy.org. And I will have that on the show notes along with a link to her book as well, where you can purchase that book. And I truly, I don't, you know, when I have authors on, I don't just like, oh, yeah, it's a great book type of thing. I really do read it. And I'm like looking at, yes, I think it'd be beneficial. And I truly do think that if you are looking for something that has some structure and that you can go week by week in and create your own rituals, this book really is a beautiful addition to have for all my book readers out there, because I know there's quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. But it's like, this is something to add into your repertoire to pull from. And Catherine, I just want to say thank you so Mm -hmm. much for being on today. Thank you for writing this book Mm -hmm. and for doing what you do in our world. And I just really appreciate you taking the time of coming on. Well, this has been so wonderful to spend this time with you and with your listeners. Thank you for your rich questions. I really, really have enjoyed my time, myself and our time. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And remember, if you have a loud inner critic, one that tells you you're not enough or you can't do something, head over to NicoleBurgessCoaching.com and download your Turn Your Inner Critic Into Your Inner Guide in four steps. <laughs>